continuing our series through the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you would turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, beginning verse 12. We have it in our bulletin. If you have a physical Bible, or you can get it on your phone. But turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. And before we begin, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that your word might not go forth void, but that you might bring forth fruit, that you might be able to speak through me and use me as an instrument for your glory. Help us to see your son Jesus, even in a book such as Ecclesiastes, that we are prone to neglect, that we are quick to forget about or ignore. Help us, even though this might be a hard topic for us, to realize our need to sit under the words of Solomon for us to not despair, but to see the hope that is offered and it is calling for in the gospel. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 12. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. This is the word of God. Percy Shelley, an English poet, describes a traveler from an antique land who spoke of an image in a desert. And this image in a desert had the picture of a ruler with wrinkled lips and a sneer of cold command. And under that image, there was a pedestal with these words inscribed, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. And if you heard those words without context, you would be conjuring up ideas of human achievement, of our ability to create these great civilizations, of our ability to make lasting legacies in this world. And yet, if you know the end of that poem, there was nothing beside remaining except for lone and level sand that stretched far away. We have this innate desire to be remembered. We want people to look at our accomplishments, to look at our wisdom, to look at our legacy and be remembered. And even Solomon, our teacher in the book of Ecclesiastes, he is looking at these desires that we have within ourselves. He understands and he knows them himself. And he's beginning to search and to investigate into them. The whole book of Ecclesiastes is essentially Solomon doing investigative journalism of life under the sun and what purpose and meaning we can find from it. Because the question to be asking ourselves from this text that Solomon is calling us to think about is this. Where does my work and my wisdom leave me with life under the sun? Again, the question for us today from this text is this. Where does my work and my wisdom leave me in life under the sun? Because look, and we would see the first point. There is actually an introduction Paul, or Solomon makes. But before that, we are going to see the first point, that there's a paradox in our work. Immediately, the teacher introduces himself. 
And he says he is the preacher who has been king over Israel and Jerusalem, verse 12. And reality is, when we think about those words, there's actually only two people that could take that title, because King David was the one to conquer Jerusalem in 2 Samuel chapter 5. And by the end of Solomon's reign, the nations would be divided. So with Solomon, with his wealth, with his wisdom, with his renown, there is no one that could be speaking of this, be speaking in this book except for Solomon. But not only do we see Solomon's introduction as the preacher in verse 12, but keep going, and in verse 13, he gives us his method throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Read for yourself in verse 13. What does he say? I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. He is essentially going to be a scientist, and he's going to do this inquiry into life under the sun. And even him using that word wisdom there, he's purposely trying to place himself within the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes, it is wisdom literature. He is asking the same questions that Proverbs, that Job is asking, because all three of wisdom literature are asking, what does life look like? What is the world we live in? How does it operate? What does it mean for us to live wisely in this world? But then even consider, since they're in relationship to each other, think about the relationship between Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. Because if you know the book of Proverbs, you know that it actually approaches wisdom in this way. Here are a couple Proverbs that Solomon says. Wisdom will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Long life is in wisdom's hand. Whoever finds wisdom finds life. But then what do we just hear in Ecclesiastes? What is Solomon saying here? What does the teacher tell us about wisdom? Look for yourself in the second half of verse 13. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Rather than wisdom helping Solomon, wisdom is the thing that frustrates him. Wisdom is the thing that is calling into question the problems of life. The key to understanding wisdom literature, and it's tempting for us here at this point, we, we might want to try to pit them against each other. And Ecclesiastes is trying to speak against what Proverbs is saying, and Job is speaking another voice. But re the reality is, and how we actually should be reading wisdom literature is complementary voices, almost like Dolby surround sound, where they are all speaking together, speaking of the same thing, having a dialogue and conversation with one another. Tim Mackey, if you have heard of the Bible Project, where they release these videos on various books of the Bible, he gives a helpful illustration to help us think about wisdom literature. Imagine there are three people sitting in a bar, and there is a young woman she is a little idealistic. She's new to teaching, but she's the type of friend you'd want to have around because she has great advice on taxes. She tells you the best way to raise your children. She tells you how to be a hard worker, and her name is Proverbs. And she says, fear God, pursue wisdom, and generally blessing is going to be found in your life. But then... The middle-aged professor smoking a cigar named Ecclesiastes pipes up, and he says, you know, I, I heard John down the street. He was doing all of that. He was fearing God. He pursued wisdom. Uh, the IRS is levying his bank account right now. He's actually losing his home. He is going to be homeless soon. He did every all of that, and it doesn't seem like life is working out for him very well. And Job is just sitting in the corner because he's a grizzled old man and he's seen too much in life and he doesn't even want to be talking about this conversation to begin with. The key to reading wisdom literature is they are all important for us. And for different stages in life, they can be vital for us as Christians. But the key to reading them is not to pit them against each other because actually they are all speaking against the same things. Proverbs would be speaking against this, and the very thing that Ecclesiastes is against is what all three of them would be speak against. It's this mechanical understanding of retribution, where we think and we have this expectation that just because we put good into the world, just because we pursue wisdom, we pursue God, that we should have the expectation of blessing. 
Because how often do we fall into that trap? How often do we have this trap of expectation where I'm a hard worker, I show up early to work, I never get written up, so I should be the last person to be laid off. I take care of my body. I exercise every day, so I shouldn't be the one to have high cholesterol. Or that's just some petty things. How about our relationship with God? Of how often I pray three times a day, I read the Bible, I go to church, I tithe, I do all these things, so God has to bless me. It's almost expected that God is going to give something that he has never promised us. Psalm's not arguing for the, against the pursuit of wisdom. He's echoing back to a story we have. He's echoing back to the story of Genesis, if you know it, particularly chapter 3. And we see these imageries and allusions back to Genesis chapter 3 of the story of Adam, where he fell in the garden. And when Adam fell in the garden, God curses the ground that he works. As God says he, you're going to toil you are going to labor under the sun. And because of that, what does Solomon say? He is looking back on Genesis 3. What is his conclusion looking at life under the sun with the result of that? Look at verse 14. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. And even just giving a summary of the worldview of how he views the world, verse 15 what is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. You may feel stuck today. You may look at the world. You may be absolutely frustrated by injustice that happens in this world, that there just doesn't seem to be answer to questions that you are bringing to this world. And that's actually the imagery Solomon is trying to give with Hevel there, with vanity. We've already talked about that last week, of it being this transient and temporal, temporary nature to it. And then Solomon is going to expand on that, saying that Hevel is striving after the wind. And that imagery makes perfect sense when you think about it. It's that idea of chasing after something that you cannot grasp, you cannot hold on to, and the second, the moment you have it, it is gone. We can so often find ourselves falling into that. We are pursuing and chasing after our legacy. We are pursuing after ideals of the next job promotion, of the next raise, of the next leg up in work. Or maybe you're kind of done with work. You're in a different stage in life where you're just trying to think about the legacy you're going to leave behind. You're thinking about what influence that you can have when you're gone. Or maybe you're just starting in life and you have all these dreams and aspirations of what you can leave in this world because you have so much ahead. Solomon is reminding us that all of this is just like Ozymandias. It is here today. It's gone tomorrow. It is Hevel it is striving after the wind. Even when we catch it, we lose it. All of these pursuits that we can fall into, this trap, this rat race that we fall into, is nothing new under the sun. And Solomon is warning us of the paradox of our work, of seeking and pursuing these accomplishments as if they need to become our God, where he reminds us they're going to be gone. Not only do we see a paradox in our work and accomplishments, but keep going. And Solomon speaks about a paradox in our wisdom. Because keep reading in verse 16. Solomon doesn't just talk about our work. Look at verse 16. What does he say? He speaks about his wisdom. I said in my heart, basically saying, I gave my whole self to this pursuit. I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And you hear those words Solomon has just said. And you're saying, didn't we just say there were only two Israelite kings in Jerusalem? So Solomon, if you were wiser than all of the kings before you, you're saying you're smarter than your dad? That doesn't sound like that great of an accomplishment to begin with. In fact, that's actually, this is a verse where often we talked about, it's debated where Solomon even wrote this, and this is one of the verses we point to. 
But actually, the wording there, when we look at the Hebrew, the sense we're supposed to have here is not this temporal idea of succession of kings. Think of the verse in Exodus chapter 20, if you know the first commandment, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. What does God say? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods within my presence. What Solomon is trying to say is everyone within the spatial boundaries of his kingdom, he was the wisest and most qualified to be answering this question. But what does he say? about this pursuit of wisdom. He was the wisest person excluding Jesus to walk this earth. What does he say about the pursuit of wisdom? Look at your Bible. And he says, I have experienced that this was but striving after the wind. Proverbs talks about wisdom bringing life. Ecclesiastes speaks about frustration in looking after wisdom. The wiser Solomon became, the more frustrated he was. The more he understood how the world operates, the less it made sense to him. The more crooked, the more lacking his questions became. Even the closing verse of our text today, look at verse 18. What does the pursuit of wisdom bring? In much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases, increases knowledge increases sorrow. Where does intelligence stand for you today? What is the purpose for you pursuing after wisdom, knowledge, and understanding? How important is it for you to be the smartest person in the room? Or to at least feel like you are the smartest person in the room? Because Solomon, who was always the smartest person in the room, he pursued after this. He dedicated his life to this. This was a blessing from God we see in 1 Kings. What does he say wisdom brought him in the end? Frustration, emptiness, and striving after the wind. He was chasing after a goal that he could never hold on to and grasp for very long. Even think of a real life illustration of someone like Bobby Fischer. You may have heard of Bobby Fischer before he was a chess champion. He was the world champion in the 1970s, and he spent from basically eight years old throughout his entire life just playing the game of chess. And he had this compulsive and obsessive nature of being the best chess player, beating every possible opponent he ever had. And by the 1970s, he qualified for the candidates. He passed through the candidates, which means he would go on to the world championship and face Boris Spassky. And in 1972, Bobby Fischer became the world champion of chess. It was seen not only as a victory in a board game, it was so important in the 70s of the heightened tensions of the Cold War that it was a victory of the US over the Soviet Union. But then Bobby Fischer, you might have known his life, because he disappears for 20 years. He actually defects from the US. There's probably some issues going on with his life. But he gave an interview very close to his death, actually. And what does he say that chess brought him? The thing that it was the only thing he pursued in his life. What does he say about chess? One of the final interviews he says is how much he hated the game. How much it was just memorization. How much it was just looking at computers. Because computers took off at the end of his life how there was no art to the game anymore. But the reality was, Bobby Fischer wasn't really that great of a chess player anymore. And everyone knew it. He was pretty low on the totem pole at that point. And the thing that he obsessed over, the thing he wanted to be the best at by the end of his life, he was honestly kind of a joke. When blind pursuit of this perceived understanding of intelligence, of wisdom, of knowledge is our God, then by the end of our life, we are probably going to look like Bobby Fischer. We are going to chase and obsess over degrees. We are going to chase over the books we can read, the people that we can think about, the advice we can give. We can plunge the depths of knowledge and understanding, but what does the wisest person, Solomon, say about this pursuit? He 
comes back to the same thing. It is absolute vanity. It is striving after the wind. Because come back to that question we are asking from the beginning. Where does my work and my wisdom leave me with life under the sun? According to Solomon, if he's trying to seek the purpose and meaning of life under the sun, and he's looking at his accomplishments, and he's looking at his wisdom, and according to him, they either will disappear in our lifetime, they will bring frustration to us, or we will just look at the lack of an understanding in this world, because verse 15 is basically a summary statement of the life under the sun when we are just thinking about how the world operates from our own understanding. What is crooked cannot be straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. And that's really the key to understanding Ecclesiastes. That's really what separates it in wisdom literature is Solomon is just trying to use his autonomous, unaided reason, looking at the world, looking at what he sees, and what are his conclusions about it. Because in Proverbs, Solomon, who is also the author of much of that, he talks about wisdom, and he gives general principles and understandings about how the world operates. And basically, you're playing statistics with the world. In Job, we at least get a, an introduction, and we see what God's doing. We have, we're introduced into the heavenly court, and we know God is operating. But in Ecclesiastes, God feels distant. It's just Solomon looking at the world, looking at what his own wisdom can bring. He's showing that there's something about the world that even is true for us today. It's not just for Solomon, but even is true for us as Christians looking at this world. Our goals, our aspirations can often feel insignificant. Our life can feel temporary and transitory, and striving after goals and accomplishments that are going to be here today and gone tomorrow. And that's not an Old Testament thinking, because actually, when we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, it was referenced in the New Testament. It was referenced, before we even get to that, Solomon is purposely looking back to what we said. He is referencing the story of what happened in the garden, of what Adam, when he fell, he brought something that happened in this world. He, at, he Because of his fall in the garden, we live in a frustrating world. We live in a world that is corrupted by sin that will lack answers to the questions we are bringing it. And we are so often going to find ourselves in the seat of our teacher without an answer. But that's not just the Old Testament. Because Paul, in Romans chapter 8, he mentions this frustrating nature of the world. He even alludes to the book of Ecclesiastes. I would even encourage us to turn to the book of Romans for a moment. Romans chapter 8, if you have a Bible. Because in Romans chapter 8... Paul alludes to the book of Ecclesiastes. What does he say about it? He mentions the, that it's not the fault of creation. He speaks about this is a problem that is inherent to our life. It is because of sin itself. Because he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 20, this Creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, not because there's something wrong with creation. It was declared good by God, but because of him who subjected it. The Adam, because he is our federal head, because of what he did at the garden, he has subjected all of us to the frustrating nature of this world. We can see suffering we can feel inadequate and we can feel insignificant and see injustice happening in the world. And Paul himself speaks about that. But if you're in Romans 8, verse 20, he says that it was subjected to futility, not willingly, but it actually is going towards a goal in verse 21. Because Paul says in verse 21 that it's in the hope that creation itself would be set free from the bondage of corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That creation and we ourselves are not left in this desert, frustrated, without questions, without answers to our questions. Because actually, 
God sees the frustrating nature of this world, and he answered it in a person. He answered it through Jesus Christ, who came into this world, and he experienced the hevel and frustration of existence. He was the one who came and was rejected by his own people. When he came to the cross, he was rejected and abandoned by his disciples. When he was on the cross, he felt rejected and abandoned by God himself, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, as the greatest king over Jerusalem, the wisest to ever exist, suffered the death that we deserve for our sins. He paid the penalty for our sins. He experienced the evil of our world. And he is the only savior that we can find and bring ourselves out of the frustrating nature of it. He understands our frustration. He understands what we're going through. And even in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's important for us as Christians to sit under the wisdom of Solomon. We're not less of Christians just because we, we are struggling and we see what's going on in the world. It's important for us to sit in Ecclesiastes, to realize what Solomon is trying to point us to, but then realize that the whole book of Ecclesiastes is left asking this question. It is demanding a response, and that response is answered by God sending his son Jesus into this world. You may feel like life under the sun does not make sense. That your works, your accomplishments, your wisdom, whatever we are pursuing is frustrating. That life is hard. That we are going through so much turmoil. But it's important for us to realize the importance of sitting under that. And realize even Paul himself talks about we ourselves groaning over the frustrating nature of this world. But we are are given an answer in Jesus Christ and what he's done, who sees us in our situation. He experienced the hevel of this world, and he is actually giving us a direction to be looking forward to into the future. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I know that we are ones who groan. We are ones who live in this broken world. We live in a world that is tainted by sin. And so often when we are trying to look for answers to life, to meaning, for purpose, we are left questioning. We are left with more questions than answers. Father, I pray that we might be able to sit under the wisdom of Solomon in this book, But ultimately, we would be able to see that this is pointing forward to what Christ, the greatest king over Jerusalem, what he has accomplished at the cross, where we can actually have answers to these questions. And although we might still be frustrated in this world, that we are continuing to groan, that we have direction, purpose, and meaning to look forward to into the future. Pray all of us, we might be able to sit under these truths today. We pray this all in your son's holy name. Amen.